Hello, Prof Professor Claris. Nice to meet Hello. you. Nice to meet you. Call me Claris. I'm trying to to make this platform work. Cool. Can I share my screen? Yes. Can you try once? You can hear me clearly, right? Yes. Yes. I can also hear you clearly. So maybe you can try uh, to share your screen once. Uh, there is this uh, button, the, the, like a arrow and a... Yeah, yes. yeah, it, it, it start, it's starting to work. Yes, uh, and it, this, this is a very nice platform. Yes, it's very nice. Like, it, it's kind of more professional than, than Zoom. Then, yeah. Yeah, and you can also host, you know, like big events, you know, if there are like, um, talks, you know, lined up like one after another. You oh, can, you nice. can do, do it quite, quite well. Yes. Cool. <laughs> yes. Uh, really. Enter full screen. Yes, cool. I, I can see it. I can see it very well. <laughs> okay, y you can see and, and hear me, right? Yes, I can. I can see you very clearly. Nice. It, it it must be morning in in California, I guess. Yes. Right? W what time is it there? So uh, we are in three different time zones. Um, you're in California, obviously. Uh, some of us are in Europe. I uh, work in Munich, and a lot wow. of our okay. Yes, a lot of our quantum enthusiasts, they are in Nepal. In so, Nepal, cool, okay. Yeah, in Nepal it's like, I think 8.45 p.m. <laughs> oh my god, good evening everyone. Yeah, good evening, and here it's like 5 p.m. 5, okay. Uh, so it's like, it, it was sort of a challenge for me, you know, to, to like just find the right time for you especially right. and, and and for everybody, you know, yeah. So in, in Germany, it's time for a beer already. It's time for beer. It's beer o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yes. Um, yeah. So we will wait um, a few more minutes and cool. uh, have have some more people join in, and then we can start. Cool. C yeah. Can I, can I ask the people who are already here to introduce themselves, maybe? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, cool. Maybe we start with. Uh, Prashim, is it okay, Prashim? I will ask you. I will invite you on on stage, and you can tell a few words to us. So there you go. Prashim is getting ready. So in this platform, you need to sort of give people mic as as uh, oh, it's called, I and see. then cool. they'll they'll accept you know the the mic, and you can bring them to the stage. Cool. So th that's how it works. So Prashim is getting ready. Okay. Uh, could could you hold the mic, Prashim, or did it not work? Maybe you can also you can also write me on the chat. Okay. So Prashim wants mic. Let's see. Uh, yeah. For some reason, he's not able to grab. We'll, okay. There he is. There he is. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Prashim. Yeah. So. Why don't you go ahead and maybe uh, give a little introduction? Since we are quite few today, we, we have some time. Uh, I cannot. We cannot. I cannot hear you, Prashim. Hmm. Can you hear him, Clarice? No. 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 Okay. Uh, yeah. For some reason. It is not possible to hear. Can you speak, Prashim? Yeah, it's. <laughs> oh. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's. Uh... Hi, <laughs> hi. <laughs> hello. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Okay, sorry, Prashim. Uh, we will try again. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I will get you back to 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 the uh, uh, group, and let 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 me try other. Hello? Hello? I think I lost you. Uh, are you there? Yes, can you Is hear it? me? Oh, yeah, yes, N now I can, you can hear, hear me, right? Again. Okay. Yes. Okay, so let us get uh, Aryan here, if it's possible. Yeah, so in this sense, there's about uh, upsides and downsides, you know, to this platform. I mean, 
it's professional and you can do like a summit and organize a lot of talks here, but then right. you see when, yeah, when you want to get people on board, it's, yeah. Oh, not, it's, and, and they cannot unmute themselves or anything. Yeah. I don't know why. Like, I think if they're on the phone or on, on their, uh, 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 notepad, let me try some more. Nitez. Yeah, it's a little bit unfortunate. Okay. Yes, oh, oh hello. Oh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm Nitis. I study physics at uh, Jacobs University in Bremen. Uh, currently, I'm doing internship uh, related to quantum computing, especially and quantum cell law automata. Nice. Mm, pretty so, exciting. So, uh, uh, are you a theorist? Or... Sorry? No. no. Uh, are you a theorist? Do you do theory or experiments? Uh, the theory experiment? You mean? Uh, 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 I, I didn't understand if you were a theorist or, or an experiment. Yes, I'm a theorist. A theorist. Cool. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> and you're right now in Germany just like me, no? Nitez? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Nitez. Okay, we will try uh, other quantum enthusiasts. Um, let us see. Okay, Luxman. Luxman actually is going to the U.S. Uh, oh, to nice. study. He got a scholarship. Nice. Um, yeah, congratulations um, to attend. Uh, he, 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 he will introduce yes. Uh, yes. himself. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Okay, so Luxman is grabbing Mike. Uh Okay. Luxman, can you grab mic? Or or maybe you can request. I think like requesting is is it seems like it's easier to do that. Uh yeah, if let me try again. Yeah, it's a little bit a little bit annoying to 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 get people. They should improve this, I guess. <laughs> okay, uh, you cannot grab Mike, right, Luxman? Hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's try Binayak. Okay, there he is. Oh, yes. hello. Hi, Binayak. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. So, yeah. Hello, I'm Binayak Zai and I recently gave my grade 11 exam. And I am also a full stack web developer. And uh, now I'm in the path of machine learning. Mm. Okay. Cool. Very interesting. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. You like machine learning? Yes. You're so, yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Binayak. Yes. Uh, okay. We. I'll. I'll get you back. And so. Some more. Yeah, so it's it's like when people tune in from phone, I think that's when they have problems. So those who tune in from uh, a laptop, it it seems like it's easier, you know. So yeah, maybe maybe the right. yeah the, the the operating system is not like compatible, you know. It, it's kind of it's sad, <laughs> yes. But but I think we we got to hear from at least at least Almost some everyone, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay, so. Maybe we can start. I, I want to, um, uh, so, I mean, this is like weekly meetup. We, we do, we try to do every, every week. I welcome everybody to, um, one quantum Nepal's, uh, meetup, right? And let me share my, uh, I, I don't need to no, share. Sorry. I, I, I you, probably you want I can, to share? No. Uh, don't worry. I, I think I can okay. just, just say in words. <laughs> yes. So we are, not for profit initiative and yeah. we want to basically make uh, new technologies right like quantum technologies accessible for everybody you know from from all walks of life and we are a part of 
uh, One Quantum, which is our parent uh, non-profit uh, initiative. And we have chapters in, in Africa and in South America, US and in, in, in Nordic uh, countries. And we want to uh, build this sort of uh, almost a workforce, you know, and, and we, we provide... Yeah, it's it's a very very nice initiative. We provide like learning materials. Um, right. We uh, have a sort of professional mentorship program, you know, where we match mentors and mentees. Nice, very cool. Yeah, okay. yeah. Like we have four hundred uh, men men mentees signed up, and we uh, have hundred mentors, and we match them, you know, so that they can learn from each other. Right. This is so, so cool. Yes. Yeah, and and. Uh, students, uh, I think also from here, they, they have signed up for that. And we also organize projects and we have completed a first project, you know, from one quantum Nepal. And it's like running Grover circuit, you know, on a real quantum computer. Cool. And okay. All of, all of us here participated and, and they, uh, uh, worked on, uh, theory and also writing a script on, on, on strange works, who is our. Nice partner and they offer platform, you know, to, to yes. uh, write quotes and circuits there. And um, yeah, I, I think this is for, for, for me and for, for us, it, it's like we, we want to basically make uh, cool things, you know, I mean, quantum, we, we you know, yes. you, you and I, yes. we, we both uh, enjoy doing it. So it, it's just like we're going to play parts so that we, we people don't get left out you know so the, the yes. whole point uh, for me to get involved was was for that and we are very excited to have you professor uh there is <laughs> yeah uh it, it's it's quite a pleasure and i want to briefly uh uh make a short short introduction of of um Clarice. so to the best of my understanding and and my googling capabilities <laughs> so Professor Clarice obtained her PSc in electrical engineering in 2014 from MIT, a very prestigious, I mean, everybody knows MIT uh, in, in Nepal. <laughs> uh, she then went on to do uh, postdoctoral research at UC Berkeley uh, and Stanford uh, from 2015 to 2019, if, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, and since 2019, uh, she has been an assistant professor at University of California, Los Angeles, uh, where uh, she's the principal investigator of Quantum Biology Tech Lab. Uh, and congrats, congratulations uh, on, on that <laughs> on behalf of, of, of all, of, all of us. Um, and uh, her research interests include quantum sensing, uh, spin physics accompanying biological processes, uh, as I read on, on the website, bioimaging and, and, and many more. And, um, yeah, what I found interesting was she has been very, uh, I, I looked, looked up online a little bit more and very active in involving or, or initiative, right? Like creating open educational, uh, uh, resources that are accessible, right? For yeah. students from diverse economic background. And I, I found that pretty, pretty cool and uh, very fitting, you know, uh, for, for, uh, uh, also initiative like this right here. Cool. And, uh, very, very, very nice there. Um, and thank you very much for, for the opportunity, you know, to, to listen to, the, to you live, you know, uh, and I want well, to, yeah, g give you the stage now. <laughs> well, th th thanks for the invitation. And on that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best not to forget, but, um, actually, in uh, the spring, in spring 2022, we're going to have a online a short course. It's um, made for uh, UCLA uh, students, but it's also going to be open to, to, to anyone on uh, implementations mm. of quantum computing. It's like a series oh. of, of, of people who come give a short talk. It's for university freshmen on their favorite qubit. So every ah. session we, we have someone, one talks about photons, the other one about superconducting circuits, the other one about uh, spin centers in, in materials. So um, wow. if, 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 you, if you follow me on Twitter, uh, I'll definitely yeah. post things there. So, but but keep keep a, 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 an eye on it because th this is very cool. I think to have a an overarching idea of quantum okay. computing. And but yes, this will be online, like online. For, yes. for people in Nepal to see too. 
Okay. Yes. Oh, that's that's yes. very nice. Yes. Yeah. That's so very so nice. yes, keep on, keep on. Uh, 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 it's it's going to come again on spring twenty. Um, okay. Twenty uh, twenty two. Uh, yes, spring and we we also had um, one last year. I think some of the videos might be in our YouTube channel, but not all of them. Uh, so okay. so uh, uh, our lab, the quantum biology tech lab, does have a YouTube mm-hmm. channel, but but we we're, mm. we're starting. We're starting. So okay. uh, for okay. for sure. Uh, the 2022 series will be in our YouTube channel. Okay, too. I see. Point noted. Okay, I'll, I'll yes. definitely like um, uh, follow that because we want to collect new materials, you know. And and yes, I, I think like it's it's very very interesting for us this this kind of stuff, you know. Yeah, Thank no, you. That, that 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 that's awesome. But but actually today the the the, the subject matter here is a little bit different. But similar. Okay. I'm going to. Com- I, I hope <laughs> I will convince you that it's different but similar. So, right. <laughs> uh, I, I, I like to call myself a quantum engineer. So uh, this means that I build apparatuses to study and control things that are so small and so well protected from their environment that they're better described by the laws of quantum mechanics as opposed to the laws of classical mechanics that rule everything big around us. So uh, let me try to explain a little bit the, the title of my talk, right? So as a quantum mechanic or a quantum engineer, I do know a little bit what spin physics is, and we're going to get to that. But what about biosensing, right? What, what, do I, what do I have to do with bio? And I'm the first one to, to, to admit that beyond high school, I've never taken a biology course. So what do I want? So Before I explain where I'm going, I really need to tell you where I come from. So uh, we're going to start talking about hardcore quantum mechanics, in particular about quantum sensing. And by the end of the talk, we will have talked about things of biological relevance, such as organism migration, how our body uh, responds to oxidative stress, radiation. And I hope I will have convinced you Uh, that we can actually learn with nature to build better technologies. And that's because I'm a quantum engineer interested in how quantum physics informs biology at the nanoscale. So I'm going to to open a big parenthesis to start my talk. This parenthesis is going to be closed at some point. And to motivate this parenthesis, I would like to say that I think that uh, humankind is obsessed with measuring things better because it means or might mean that we understand things or nature better in general, right? So we can think about measuring better frequencies. This is an atomic clock uh, at the National uh, uh, Institute for for uh, timekeeping, if you will, at the US called NIST. And this atomic clock helps you determine very precisely what a second is based on uh, an atomic transition we can think about measuring better magnetic fields so that the image of your baby is better resolved. And yes, this is a magnetic resonance image of a baby inside the mother's belly. And we can also think about measuring, say, better accelerations so that your gaming experience is improved. Such tiny uh, accelerometers are now ubiquitous in all our handheld devices. But the question that I ask is, what happens if the quantity that you want to measure is very, very small. Or worse, what happens if the object causing the quantity that you want to measure is very, very small? I'm going to argue that we're going to need a tiny little sensor that can measure tiny little things. If the sensor is tiny, let's make it very tiny. Let's make it quantum. And actually, there's a whole body of mathematical evidence that proves that if you use a quantum object as a sensor, your measurement is improved. In other words, the sensor quantumness enhances the measurement. Um, In particular, I want to talk to you about a technological quantum sensor that I worked with in the past. I put a single spin in uh, the material diamond to work as a quantum enhanced magnetometer. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but that's what I promise, right? A single spin as a magnetometer, just so that you you, you recall, um, 
spin and 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 I have my props now you should be looking at me a little bit because I have I have like uh, my tiny little spin um spin is a mer- merely quantum uh property okay that has no real classical equivalent and uh spin measures how well a particle interacts with magnetic fields so electrons have spin uh, uh some atomic nuclei have spin and usually uh physicists and chemists represent spin with an arrow and spin up or spin down mean two different energy levels of this merely quantum property called spin okay just as as a reminder uh but the the single spin that i worked with in diamond uh was a, a arose from a crystal defect okay um it, 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 some crystal defects in uh, diamond they're very uh, like, like lattice defect they they're very special some crystal defects in diamonds are called color centers uh, color centers are defects that absorb light and then emit back fluoresce and they are color centers are the responsible for the colors of those very nice diamonds that you see there at the bottom of the slide the defect the color center that i work with in particular is called a nitrogen vacancy center in diamond and it's actually a very hyped defect uh it happens naturally but it can also be engineered and it arises when one nitrogen the most commonly occurring substitutional impurity in the carbon lattice sits nearby to a vacancy to a missing carbon atom when the nitrogen and the vacancy comes together there's like a mess of electrons that 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 that, that is interacting there right there's the unpaired electrons from uh the, the vacancy there might be extra charges from nearby uh the nitrogen has an extra electron there too so uh it's it's sort of a, a anatomically sized mess but something very interesting happens when you calculate the energy levels of this mess it turns out that the energy levels of this uh, mess really resemble the energy levels of a single electronic spin okay so actually you can look at this atomically sized effect and represent it as one single spin and that's the spin that i worked with uh usually here's how you uh find those spins in the lab at room temperature right and and actually it doesn't need to be a very good diamond sample at all the first diamond that we worked with was like a re- reject for from a jeweler so you put your diamond sample on top of a moving stage and you move it around at the same time that you excite that you shine laser of an appropriate wavelength in, in this case it's green onto this sample uh the, the the idea is that as you're moving the sample once the laser hits one of those defects the defect is a color center it's going to absorb this light and then it's going to emit light fluoresce back and it emits light in the red and this light we can detect which shows us that we actually found the defect in increasing zooms this is what it looks like and to the bottom right there what you see is a single blob right uh which actually is, is quite interesting because the single blob represents the fluorescent signature of a single spin which is quite remarkable note that this blob is uh about i don't know 500 nanometers of diameter the defect itself is way way tinier it's atomically sized but this blob is diffraction limited that's why it's so large but in any case it's it's a very uh, compelling uh, and cool thing to be able to see a signature from one single spin but the fluorescence of this one single spin is actually even more special than that in that in jargon it's said to be quantum state dependent this means that just by looking at how strongly this bulb is emitting light you can actually know if it's up the spin is up or down that is up spin up or spin down will emit different fluorescence intensity levels 
Okay, so this is how people, if you're familiar with this jargon, do quantum state detection for this spin in diamond. And all of this is 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 very cool and very nice to play with and very convenient to play with in a lab. But I promise you that we would put this spin to work as a very sensitive magnetometer, and here's how it works. There I depict uh, two different uh, energy states. So the vertical axis is energy, and I call them zero and one, but the, you can think about two different energy states of the single electron spin. Actually, their energy difference is in the microwave regime. It's about three gigahertz. Right? And it turns out that one of those states, state that I, that I call zero, is insensitive to a magnetic field, whereas the state that I call one is sensitive to a magnetic field. Okay? This means that if the material, the diamond, sees some magnetic field, state zero won't care, whereas state one will actually be promoted by a tiny little quantity delta that if you have seen this in your physics classes from the Zeeman effect you can show that the amount of uh, of energy shift that the plus one state will suffer is proportional to the magnitude of the magnetic field okay so now the point that I'm going to make is actually very important and it doesn't get usually made right the problem of measuring a magnetic field is sort of mapped into the problem of knowing how to measure a little detuning, a little offset from a known resonance between zero and one, the, measuring this tiny detuning delta from this known energy difference between zero and one. And measuring uh, offsets from resonance is something that is a signal processing problem, in fact. And it's something that engineers and physicists have known how to measure for many, many decades. So we're going to be able to use this spin as a magnetic field sensor because the experimentalist is able to measure those offsets from resonances that indicate the magnitude of the magnetic field. Okay, so this is a very important point. This is all, this is mainly how many modalities of quantum sensing works. Okay, it's, it's like an energy difference that is proportional to some quantity that you want to measure. This is a, a general statement about quantum sensing. But, but th this uh, spinning diamond is actually only very good as a quantum sensor, while its quantum properties last. You might remember that everything that starts quantum dies classical, right? Uh, when, when, when things start interacting with, with their environment. So uh, uh, if you will, and if you um, have uh, had uh, uh, advanced quantum classes before. <clears throat> um, spins, single spins, while they're well described by the laws of quantum mechanics, can exist in a state of spin superposition. That is, it can be a combination of zero and one, if you will. It can be uh, state zero plus state one. It's a superposition of those spin states. As the, the spin is no longer able to, to, is no longer well described by the laws of quantum mechanics, this spin sort of becomes a uh, classical arrow. It can be either up or down, but no longer a superposition of both. And actually, it can be shown that the quantum sensor power is only active while the spin can be in a uh, coherent superposition. And uh, the time during which it, it's well described by quantum mechanics is usually known as coherence times. Okay, And coherence times uh, in, in a crappy diamond at room temperature and in the solid state, in the mass of the solid state lattice is about, uh, for this defect, two microseconds, which actually is incredibly, incredibly long. Okay, uh, Actually, people now making engineering materials to, to increase this number, but even in crappy, naturally occurring diamond, this coherence time is two microseconds, which is super, super long, and which is the reason why people can use this uh, sensor, this 
this defect as a quantum sensor even at room temperature, which actually is very, uh, very important for biology. But I'm not going to talk about biology in, in, in res with respect to the sensor at all. But, but uh, the, the idea then, and, and again, it's an also, uh, another general idea. The idea for uh, quantum sensing and for quantum computing is general is, can we keep this uh, spin as a quantum object for longer and longer? Right. So you can imagine that uh, you can imagine this as a um, signal processing problem. Right. If you have a signal as a function of time, the longer you can acquire the signal, the, the longer that it takes before the signal dies. When you Fourier transform the signal, the better the resolution of your spectrum. Right. So here it's the same thing. The longer we can keep this uh, spin alive as a quantum object, the longer it can be used as a sensor and the better your frequency information, if you will, will be. And the way that we do, uh, the, what we use uh, to uh, kick very precisely uh, matter quantum bits or, or spins, qubits, in order for them to, to, to live longer as a, as a qubit is by applying light is by applying electromagnetic pulses. You can think of it like a, a swing, right? If you, if you apply gentle kicks to the swing at particular times, the swing will keep on oscillating. The, the idea is the same. If we apply electromagnetic pulses at very uh, particular, very particular ways to this spin, we can actually keep it alive for longer and longer, which means that we can play with it for longer and longer and that and thus improve our measurement. Um, quantum control of uh, matter quantum bits has been done for many, many decades and it started in the field of nuclear magnetic resonance. They controlled, wait, what happened? I, I can hear you, Clarice. Do you, you can hear. Um, you can hear me. Yes, everything is fine. Oh, so that's so Did weird. So, some, yeah. Something. My. my it, oh, I lost control of my screen. Ah. Uh, hmm. We can see your screen and we can hear you perfectly clearly, uh, I, but I cannot on your end, move you lost it. it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I cannot move it. I'll, I'll stop screen sharing and I'll I'll, I'll okay. put it up again. All right. Okay. Okay. Oh. Oh. This is so crazy. My yeah. Sorry, uh, my my PDF window closed. So I have to open. Ah, okay. Okay. So it... that that's a, I, 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 I forgot to tell you but uh, but please feel free to pause me and ask questions via the chat and and if some could read the questions aloud for me from the chat or, or or feel free to unmute yourself but it's complicated in this platform. What are your questions so far since I have I, I'm going to to pause for questions but okay. aha can you aha can you see my screen? Uh I cannot yet. You could Oh. Mm -hmm. Did did you try to share? This is so crazy. That something is going on. But the PDF opens. The PDF opens. Mm -hmm. And now you cannot share, right? That's the problem. Okay, ah. now something is happening. Okay, you see my screen? Yes. Now, now I, I can see at least. What about you guys? Yes. C can you all see the screen? Yes. So they they write. Awesome. They can all see the screen. <laughs> awesome. So sorry for that. It's 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 what happens when we have <laughs> Zoom meetings. Okay. So what I was saying is that uh, people have known how to kick matter qubits with electromagnetic fields very precisely in a timely way from the field of magnetic nuclear magnetic resonance that, that is known for like 60, 70 years now. I'm going to show you one example of uh, co spin control in the next slide, which is probably going to be the most uh, technical in this talk. 
But before, I would just like to make sure that you don't forget the big picture, okay? The big picture is having a tiny little sensor that you bring in close proximity to a tiny little sensor, to a tiny little sample, and then would like to be able to sense magnetic fields produced by this tiny sample using this very tiny sensitive magnetic field sensor. Okay, that's the big picture. But now let me show you how we play with those pins to kick it in a way that we can play with it for a long time. So um, some time ago, I used a particular sequence of electromagnetic excitation to kick my spin to make it work as a very good magnetometer. The particular sequence that I used is called the rotary echo. It's been known in nuclear magnetic resonance since the 60s. And uh, the, the way it works is depicted there in nuclear magnetic resonance jargon to the right. What this means is that I am applying a continuous uh, microwave to my spin tuned to the zero to one original energy difference. The microwave is a CW, is continuous, but at particular intervals, I'm going to flip the phase of this signal. Okay, just flipping the phase at intervals that actually the experimenter can uh, choose and, and, and for reasons that I won't uh, 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 be able to explain, the, the timing of the flip can be used for different things. Okay, so this is what I do. I get my um, spin qubit that might be sensing a tiny magnetic field. I put CW microwave tuned to the original zero and one resonance. Okay, and I flip the phase of this microwave at particular interval. This electromagnetic pulse sequence is known in nuclear magnetic resonance to correct for driving field imperfections, that is microwave imperfections, imperfections in your microwave generator. But it's also known not to correct detunings from your resonance. And if you remember from my past slide, detunings from the resonance is exactly what I want to measure. So it's good that the sequence keep those intact. Okay, And, and again, the lens of, of time that it takes before I do my phase flips uh, has to do with correcting for different types of noise that this qubit senses in its environment. And if we uh, do this, if we apply this um, it, it, it signal to a spin qubit, this is what we get as a function of time. So there you see the signal coming out of the sensor. And this is actually just fluorescence, okay? Fluorescence intensity as a function of the time that we apply this CW microwaves with phase flips. What this means is that uh, you, you don't have to, to, to know uh, 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 how to read the signal uh, yet, but I can tell you that uh, this, if, you, if you're familiar with this, this looks like a modulated Rabi experiment, okay? This means that if you are at the top of one of those uh, oscillations there, you are, say, in spin up. If you are at the bottom of one of those oscillations, you are in spin down. And everything in between indicates that you are in a superposition of zeros, uh, of spin up and spin down. Okay. We can use a, uh, a, a theoretical uh, machinery called average Hamiltonian theory to uh, determine how the signal depends on the detuning delta, the tiny detuning from resonance that we want to measure. Okay, so we, we know um, how the detuning depends on, uh, 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 how the detuning appears onto the signal. And since we know this, we can actually, uh, 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 oops, we can actually Fourier transform this signal and get something that looks like a spectrum. I'm not going to, to explain uh, how to read this spectrum. All that I can tell you is that with this experiment, we are actually resolving um, uh, 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 detunings. Actually, we're resolving three detunings, 
suffered by this that that this this uh, qubit sees the smallest of which is about one tenth of the magnetic field of the Earth. So this is one way that we can kick our spin so that it works in a very nice way as a magnetic field sensor. But again, this is the big picture. Don't forget the big picture, tiny sensor, tiny uh, magnetic fields because we can see tiny tunings. And I am going to, before I stop, just make sure that uh, you understand that I have just shown you a quantum a, a sensor that works at room temperature and in noisy environments. I'm going to make a pause for questions now. And if you do not have a question, I would like you to Google something, right? I told you that the, the zero to one uh, uh, difference in energy is about three gigahertz at room temperature. I would like you to Google how much KBT, that is thermal energies, are What's the thermal energy at room temperature in gigahertz so that it's easy for us to compare? Okay, so with this, I, I, if you don't have a question, Google that and I'm ready to, to, to stop and take your questions now for the time being. I'm, I'm sure you have questions. Yes. Questions if you don't have welcome. questions, I didn't explain it right. Yes, I didn't explain it right. So I hope you have questions. <laughs> yes, um, you can just write on the chat and yes. we'll bring you up on the stage. Uh, and yes, you can Google thermal yes. energy, like what what temperature three gigahertz corresponds to. No, 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 no. It's different. Well, well, yes. Th that's one way of doing things, uh, uh, seeing how much uh, how much three gigahertz correspond to in, ter in, in thermal energies. Or uh, I think the, the the nicest way to to do this is the inverse. Is I gave you that the difference in 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 energy the, of the qubit is three gigahertz. What's the thermal bath in gigahertz that this thing is immersed in at room temperature? In other words. Like what's what's KBT at room temperature in in gigahertz units? Mm. Mm. Yes, temperature, right, right. So so room temperature. Uh, you need to know what that room temperature is. That is the first thing to Google. I would say. <laughs> yes. Uh, if you do it in Kelvin, that will be the best. And then th there's like a, a calculators online that you you can you can yes. you can you, yeah. You need conversion. Okay, Binax says it's two ninety eight Kelvin. Yes, that is more accurate. Uh, absolutely, I think right room temperature. Yes, but 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 and what does that correspond to in uh, units of gigahertz? In mm -hmm. in frequency units now. Right. Maybe I can help you here with the website. So why don't you look this website from Colby, Colby College. I, I used to use this in my school. And you can um, plug in your, your temperature there. That, that is a nice, nice website. So do we have <laughs> Yeah. It's 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 um mo so there is like table and on the table you see a place where you can put your temperature in Kelvin. So Binag writes 6209.31 and what unit is that Binayak? So that would correspond to
gigahertz. That's that's too much, I think. Tell me, tell me, how much is it? Yes, he says six thousand two hundred nine gigahertz. It is, it is, it is. Yeah. Okay. So now okay. I'd like you to pause. Okay. So let let let's see if we understand what this means. I'm telling you that there is this sensor in Diamond that has an energy difference of three gigahertz. However, it works at room temperature. It's immersed in a thermal bath that corresponds to, to, to like 6,000 gigahertz. Wow. Okay. That, that's pretty, so yeah. The yeah. thermal, that, that's pretty high. So the thermal energy is way higher than, than, the, the, uh, than the energy at which those pins work. So h- how does this pin work at room temperature then? Why doesn't it thermalize? Or does it? it do, 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 it's, so do, do you understand? It, it, some people call it a paradox. It's not a paradox. But again, this sensor that works at, at a tiny energy difference is immersed in this thermal bath that is way, way larger than the, the energy that it works at, right? W- what's the resolution for that? How can this sensor work at room temperature? What are your questions on my question? Is the question clear or not? Or, or shall I rephrase? You should all be puzzled right now. Do you understand why you should be puzzled? Yeah, so Lauren she, she says she's puzzled. Uh, she also asks a question. Can it work yes. outside room temperature? Uh, it, it, can. Uh, it can. Actually, it can be cooled down. Two, uh, um, I, I actually think uh, you can. I, I actually think it it works. Uh, it works inside cells, which is like thirty seven degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, I don't know much higher, but but y- y- yes, the, the 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 simple answer is yes. But but still, it does work at room temperature. Mm. So yes, what what do others think? Why does this small sensor, right, operating at three gigahertz, which is immersed in this this bath, right, which which is at like, uh, we estimated Binag estimated six thousand gigahertz. How 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 does how 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 do you reconcile, right, like this yes. this difference in in energy scale to operate yes. at? Why why does why does it operate at all? Why, like, I mean, maybe like, uh, like classically, if you think it classically, you know, maybe you learn in, in school, you, you have a, uh, 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 I don't know, like a metal ball, you know, certain temperature and you immerse that in like, uh, cold water, right? Huge cold water, like what happens there versus, you know, in, in this quantum scale, you know, do, do you see a difference there? I don't know if that's the right way to do. To, to, no, no, to, no, no, no. Yes, yes, that, that, that's the idea, right? Why does this thing work at all and, and doesn't immediately thermalize and, and become classical, right? So, so here's the, 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 the solution that I propose to this thing that is not a paradox, okay? You should all be puzzled, right? Because people say, so this stuff is immersed in something that is, that is poking at it with a lot of energy, right? And you're right. The the thing is the the resolution to this is to think that this spin can only work as a quantum sensor before it thermalizes, before it gets classical. Okay. Uh, actually, the if you will, the coherence time is the time that it takes for it to thermalize, for it to become just a classical needle right uh, a classical magnet so th- th- the resolution to this is that before it thermalizes because it's thermalizing very very fast because it's immersed in this bath before it thermalizes it can be used as a quantum sensor all the sensor information that you obtain 
is the information before it thermalizes. For this very short time before thermalization, it's absolutely fine for it to yield us good information via the laws of quantum mechanics. Okay, so this is not a paradox at all. I just wanted to point this out because what I'm going to talk next, remember, I have to close the parentheses. Uh, what I'm going to talk next is explained by pretty much the same thing. I'm going to talk about other quantum sensors that work at room temperature in noisy environments immersed in a bath that is way warmer, way hotter than, than the sensor's energy difference. Okay, so remember that it's immersed in a hot, hot bath, but before thermalization, it yields, it can yield bona fide quantum information. Okay, so this is extremely, extremely important. What are your questions on, on that? What are your questions in general before, because the next slide I'm going to close my parentheses and talk about what I really want to talk about. Yes. Uh, what do you think, mm, Prashim, Binayak? Any any questions on this? This is pretty interesting. Mm, I think they are afraid of me. I think I'm. I, I'm, <laughs> mm, mm, I must yes, have a very no. a very like menacing face or something. Prasim says, like, you're a great teacher and he's enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I'm going to, to, please feel free to pause me. Okay. Feel free to pause me at any time, any, any time. Uh, write your questions. I just need someone to read them up for me because I don't, I don't see the chat. But now I'm going to close the parentheses that I opened at the very uh, beginning of my talk, which was about my past. And now I'm going to tell you, uh, where I'm going. Okay. So, uh, and that's what I really, really want to talk to you about. So up to that point in my life, I was used to dealing with those sensors, those technological sensors that you see there uh, in those pictures. But, but at some point I, I realized that uh, natural sensors uh, many, many times overperform humankind made sensors in crazy, crazy ways. Okay. So uh, in my past, I, uh, I worked with, with a couple of, of natural made sensors, a light sensor and a magnetic sensor. The light sensor was classical, but I hope to convince you that the magnetic sensor is quantum. And actually it's quantum and it's going to be behaving in, in, a, in a very similar way to the spin in diamond that I have just shown you. Okay, But to start talking about this natural a magnetic sensor, I'm going to have to talk about biology at the nanoscale, namely the chemistry. So it's been known for uh, many, many decades now in basic chemistry that magnetic fields can alter the final products of a class of chemical reactions that involve spin-correlated electrons. Okay? Don't worry about this uh, too much. I'm going to, to talk a little bit about this, but that's not the important part. But by spin-correlated electrons, I mean that certain chemical reactions involve entangled electrons, if you have heard this before. okay. And yes, magnetic fields are going to uh, alter chemical reactions that involve entangled electrons. So um, now... Uh, you should be all be looking at me because I'm going to do things with my head now. Okay, if you if you cannot see if my my camera doesn't let you if I'm not in the right position, let me know. This is how this works in basic chemistry. Assume that you have uh, two electrons at the outer electronic shell of a molecule. It's usually a fluorescent molecule a molecule that uh, absorbs light and then emits back, okay? The chemical reactions that are magnetic field dependent, they start with the absorption of a photon. This photon gives enough energy for one 
Oh, b- before I forget, those two uh, electron spins, they are in a singlet state, that is one pointing up and one pointing down, as opposed to a, a triplet state, where the spins point in the same direction, because this is their most energetically favorable state. And, and, and there's also the Pauli exclusion principle that says that one has to be up, the other one has to be down. That's why they are uh, singlet states. Okay, uh, something that people don't usually mention that I'm going to mention now is that a singlet state is an entangled state. Okay, and that's that, that's how entanglement is going to, to, to come, but it's not important. It's it's very tangential. So singlet state is an entangled state, even if people don't talk about that much. And uh, the the two outer electrons of a fluorescent molecule are in a singlet state. A photon comes and gives enough energy for one electron to get excited. It's a fluorescent molecule, so most of the times this electron is de-excited and light uh, of, a, of lesser energy is emitted back. Okay, so the cycle goes up and down. However, sometimes as the photon comes and excites this guy, instead of it going back down, okay, and emitting light, it actually meets a free electron in the chemical reaction. And I'm told by chemists that free electrons, free nearby electrons, uh, are uh, very ubiquitous. It's something that is easy to find. Now, when those two electrons start interacting, they start in a singlet state for the following reasons. Photon absorption, in the absence of any loss, is spin conserving. So that when those two spins meet, the spins need to be at the same state that this spin was in its original molecule, which was in a singlet state. So they start in a singlet state. Okay, Again, singlet state is, uh, is a, a, an entangled state. So this is sort of why uh, people say that these chemical reactions depend on uh, an entangled state because those two electrons start in an entangled state. This is going to mean that they are going to to sort of respond to each other's uh, to each other's uh, states, right? They're going to be interacting in a very important way. But apart from that, that's all the role that entanglement plays. The other thing that you need to know is that there are some chemical reactions that are spin dependent. This means that, and I'm going to use some jargon, it, if those two electron spins are measured by the environment to be in a singlet state after some time, the reaction continues through one pathway. And if the electrons are measured by the environment to be in a triplet state, the chemical reaction continues through another path. Importantly, macroscopically, those downstream paths that can happen at much, much longer timescales can give rise to macroscopically different final products. So a finicky, fast spin process at the top of such spin-dependent chemical reaction that might alter if the spins are singlet or triplet, and that happen possibly very fast before those two lose coherence, before those two die classical, right? A fast process that changes the the spins between singlet and triplet state might macroscopically alter some things much, much further in time and have macroscopic consequences. The last thing that you need to know is that... um, there is, in fact, a mechanism that is going to affect how uh, uh, the probability of finding those two spins in a triplet or singlet states. And this is the following. Those two spins uh, see different local magnetic field environments. That is, this guy here is coupled, if you will, to nuclear spins from the molecule where it came from, okay? This spin is coupled to 
to nuclear spins that make a magnetic field. So this guy sees a tiny magnetic field. Oh, this, this guy sees a magnetic field that uh, originating from the molecule where it started, whereas this guy is sort of free. He doesn't see, in principle, any other magnetic field. Now, in the presence of an external magnetic field that this whole protein sees, Importantly, if this external magnetic field is small, in particular, if it's smaller than the magnetic field seen by this electron here from the molecule, let's see what happens. This electron sees and the external magnetic field, and this guy sees the nearby magnetic field, which is relatively strong, plus this weak magnetic field external magnetic field that it almost doesn't care about, right? So to first approximation, this guy sees the external magnetic field and this guy sees the, uh, uh, the local magnetic field from where it started, okay? Spins in the presence of magnetic fields, they are more precise, okay? And they, their precession frequency, their are more frequency is proportional to the strength of the magnetic field that it sees. So this guy is sort of processing relatively very fast because of the of the the, the local magnetic field, and this guy is sort of following this weak uh, external magnetic field. Now, in the, given a change in the strength of this external magnetic field, this guy will almost not change, but this guy will actually suffer an important change in Larmor frequency, right? Because this guy responds strongly to this weak magnetic field. This means this guy is doing all the job. This means that with the change of external magnetic field, this guy is going to change strongly its Larmor frequency, which means that as the procession goes, those two spins with a changing magnetic field are going to pick different phases, okay? They're going to pick a different relative phase because the phase, the, the Larmor precession of this guy is going to change. This difference in, in picked up phase is actually going to be mapped onto a different probability of finding the spins in a triplet or singlet state. I'm going to sort of repeat this, this last part. This guy here is not doing anything. It's, it's Larmor processing super fast. This guy is weak, is uh, Larmor processing slowly given a weak external magnetic field. With a small change of the weak magnetic field, this guy is going to change its precession frequency, which means that the different picked phase in the precession between those two guys is going to strongly change with the change of this weak magnetic field because this guy is going to process differently. Okay, this different in, this difference in phase is going to be mapped into a difference in effectively the probability that those two spins are found in a singlet or in a triplet state. In other words, this weak external magnetic fields is going to maybe in a, in a relevant way, alter the probability of us continuing the chemical reaction through the singlet and the triplet states. So a weak magnetic field interacting with those two electrons might have a pretty freaky important effect on how this chemical reaction continues. Now I'm going to pause and ask for your questions. What are your questions on how this works? This is how it works in, 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 a, in a vial, okay? In a vial with fluorescent proteins, like in, in basic chemistry. What are your questions about this? Anybody got question about this interesting phenomena? What do you think about how the state of those two spin system changing 
depending on the magnetic field. There are some consequences, I guess, right? For there are some consequences. I, yes. Wait, wait, and, uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Go for it. Go for it. Sorry. Is it like um? Uh, I think now we're talking about applications, right? Like. Yes. Maybe you know. Um, I don't. I like to think about navigation, for example. Is it like relevant there? Is the sort yes. of sort of like yes, yes, yeah, okay, yes, but but not only, but totally, and and you're going to see, but that's exactly exactly how this this whole field and how biology started started entering in 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 my life and and in this talk. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. But this would be a surprising thing, right? It's it's a weak magnetic field that have macroscopic consequences because this weak magnetic field can alter the macroscopic fate of a chemical reaction. And uh, actually, again, uh, there is, this, there is, yes, question, maybe, question, question. Yes, yes. I, I think there is a question from Nites, and he says uh, there's a little confusion. Is it? the effect of little perturbation of external B field in two basis states, or am I missing something here? Uh, 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 but, uh, 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 what do you mean by basis state? I think so, he's talking about singlet or triplet say, state. Uh, so, uh, yes. So, to cut a long story short, this weak magnetic field can alter the state of this electron, right? And this is sort of going to alter if the two spins are most likely found with a certain probability, of course, in the triplet or in the singlet state. The weak magnetic field acts on this guy, on this free electron, okay? And because this is going to, 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 to make this electron pick a different phase as it's processing with respect to this guy. And effectively, what this means is that this this guy is sort of going to be more, if you will, found in this state or this state, which is going to change the probability of finding those two like this or like this. In, in a very simplified picture, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But the simplest way to model this, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, is by doing an open quantum system simulations. And it goes like this. It's uh, two electrons that do not have uh, two electron spins that do not have any interaction among them, except that they start entangled. This guy is free. It only feels the external magnetic field, whereas this guy feels the external magnetic field plus a stronger magnetic, a stronger magnetic field caused by a single nuclear spin. Okay, so again, the Hamiltonian is two electron spins that do not interact but start entangled. This guy only sees the external magnetic field. This guy sees the external magnetic field. Plus, if you're familiar with this term, the hyperfine interaction with one single nuclear spin, which is the same thing that it's saying that it feels the magnetic field sense uh, made by one nuclear spin nearby. This is how we model this with Hamiltonians in, in the simplest way. I mean, there, there are people who, who model this with like 20 spins and stuff in, in different molecules, but, but even, even I, who am an experimentalist, can, can actually model this. So the, the environmental spin that you're talking about would be like some nuclei, right? Or, or water molecules. It, uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not actually uh, water molecules. The, the, the spins uh, nearby are usually electrons, uh, nuclear spins. N nuclear spins are actually going to, to give rise to, to hyperfine interactions, which are usually relative, relatively strong, if you will. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, mm -hmm. it just, just so that I can give you some numbers and we're going to talk a little bit about those numbers soon. But um, in usual examples, the external magnetic field is about 50 microtesla, and the hyperfine field is about order of millitesla. Mm -hmm. And still, this 50 microtesla plays an important role, apparently.
this should leave you a little bit puzzled. But, uh, but, but, I mean, it is demonstrated at room temperature in solution in the gas phase, in the solid phase, and down to uh, magnetic field strengths on the order of the magnetic field of the Earth, which unsurprisingly is the, the said 50 microtesla. Okay. And in basic chemistry, there is no other way to explain what's happening in those chemical reactions, except for the explanation that I have just shared with you. Okay, there is no better explanation for what's going on. Uh, a spin physicist uh, theorist called Peter Hoare, he likes to explain it in the following way, and it's the left uh, lower uh, picture there. Okay, so if you, if you want to engage the help of a fly to tip a rock, if the rock starts in its most uh, uh, thermodynamically stable state, that is on its flat edge, you're not going to, to do much, right? The, the fly landing on one side or the other, it's not going to, to, to tip the rock one way or the other. However, if you give the rock a little bit of energy, so that it starts in an out of equilibrium state. The energy here, in our case, is the photon absorption and the, the unstable equilibrium state could be seen as like a quantum state, okay? If you actually now engage the help of the fly that can land on one end or the other, you can actually macroscopically change the state of this rock to tip to one side or the other, okay? And this sort of finicky help is also like those spin interactions. So this is the way that a finicky quantum phenomena might actually play an important role macroscopically, okay? So far, it's all chemistry, but let me talk to you about the biology. In the 70s, like a long time ago, uh, biophysicists wanted to explain how birds migrate. Because people who deal with birds, they know without doubt that birds, when they migrate north-south, they use at least as a partial cue the magnetic field of the Earth. This is known. Okay? And people really didn't know why or, or how? Why, I don't know, but, but how, right? Some brave theoretical biophysicists made the following hypothesis for the first time ever. Well, if the same type of photodependent, spin-dependent chemical reaction were to be happening at room temperature under massive physiological conditions inside the bird somewhere, right? Birds or organisms could be sensitive to magnetic fields to the extent that they could be sensitive to different final products of those spin-dependent chemical reactions. So the magnetic fields could change some chemical reactions and the organisms, the bird in this case, would respond by, by being sensitive to different physiological products, right? Macroscopically different physiological products of those chemical reactions. This was a hypothesis. Um, and at that point, since those uh, chemical reactions uh, depended on, on, on photons, right, they started with the absorption of a photon, um, people started looking at photoreceptors that are usually, but not only, uh, present in, in, in the eyes of organisms. And at that point, the only animal photoreceptor and they were looking at birds, so they really were looking at animal photoreceptor that were known to sustain uh, those uh, uh, spin-dependent chemical reactions was a photoreceptor, this, uh, a fluorescence protein that is called cryptochrome. Okay? Now, cryptochrome is present in our eyes, in the eyes of birds, in the antennas of migrating butterflies, but it's also present, and, and I think this statement is true according to biologists, it's also present in all our cells because it has circadian rhythm regulation properties, 
okay, actually, if you travel and you get jet lagged, and this is true, this is like a guy received the no prize for this in, I think, 2015. If you travel and you're jet lagged and people say, look at blue light to regulate like your, your circadian rhythm, the blue light is actually this sort of exciting cryptochromes. Okay, so cryptochromes are fluorescent proteins that are excited by blue light. So to get the long story short, uh, uh, cryptochromes exist throughout the tree of life. All those organisms there express this protein called cryptochrome. And actually, some of those species, the ones boxed in red, uh, there have been some macroscopic uh, uh, magnetosensing experiments that have been shown to have some it, it's macroscopic, so it's indirect a relationship with cryptochrome. Okay, and yes, humans are right there too. So, so right now, my stance is that evidence for cryptochrome-based magnetosensing is really, really widespread, but unfortunately, at very disconnected land scales. Okay, at the very tiny land scales, the land scales that you see to the left, are experiments done with cryptochromes in solution. Okay, In this case, cryptochromes in, in solution, I'm going to argue that they work pretty much remarkably similar to the spin in diamond sensor that I just talked to you about in the beginning of my talk. For example, and it's the top left picture, Okay. researchers measured the fluorescence emitted by this cryptochrome as a function of the time during which you were exciting with, with the laser. You were a shiny blue laser at it. The first thing that you see is that the fluorescence is decaying. This means that you're killing the, the, the fluorophore, you're killing the molecule, you're bleaching it, if you have heard this word. But as the researchers... At the same time, post a, mag a tiny magnetic field on and off, and this is not an artifact, this has been repeated, the fluorescence, as it's decaying, it got modulated up and down following the differences in magnetic fields. So if you remember from the spinning diamond, just by looking at how strongly the spin was emitting fluorescence, we could determine if it was up and down or down, depend, which depended on the magnetic field. Here, it's sort of the same thing. Just by looking at how strongly this protein is emitting fluorescence, we can actually infer the probability that the, the protein, given the magnetic field, took the singlet pathway or the triplet pathway in the chemical reaction. So this is very much similar to uh, the, 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 center, the, the spin center in diamond. Moreover, there are some chemical measurements. Those are not, I, I don't think they're final or, or anything, but they seem to indicate that those spins in cryptochrome at room temperature and in solution can be well described by the laws of quantum mechanics for up to one microsecond in solution and at room temperature. Again, this is the same order of magnitude that I quoted for the crappy diamond, which was two microseconds. So this is all in the same order of magnitude. And I find th those similarities very, very cool. Okay. However, the next lens scale step on the evidence for cryptochrome as a, a magnetosensor is done for macroscopic experiments with whole birds, whole flies, plates of cells, okay? Those experiments are, I'm going to describe them in a second, they're all consistent with the spin theory, okay? But it's very hard to motivate that, well, the bird is acting this way be because there's a quantum phenomena uh, 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 happening inside it, right? Th there's a very big disconnect in landscapes. Let me just describe real quick some experiments. During migration season, people put like 30 birds in a cage. Well, the sample size is 30, right? They do this individually. And what they do is they change an external magnetic field outside the cage and the bird wants to go out of the cage following different 
directions, depending on the magnetic field that you apply. Flies. Apparently, flies, flies can be trained to find food given the presence of a magnetic field. Okay, they train the flies to do this. Then they knock out, they remove the cryptochrome gene from the flies, and the flies without cryptochrome, they can no longer find food given the presence of a magnetic field. Then in a further experiment, the researchers put back the, 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 the human cryptochrome inside the flies, and the flies were back to finding food given the presence of a magnetic field. Okay, again, this is all consistent, but it, it's not, it, there is no, reliable, like irrefutable evidence that, that there's something quantum going on. And this is where we enter, okay? What we are starting to do here at UCLA is, is actually trying to bridge those two land scales. What we want to do is start doing chemical and quantum inspired experiments at a much smaller land scale in single proteins inside single cells. Look at the long story short. This is not my microscope. This is the microscope that I work with as a postdoc. What we're building is our glorified microscopes with coils. Okay, Microscopes, because that's how we look at those uh, biological specimens. They can be optical microscopes, uh, scanning probe microscopes with coils, because that's how we play. The, we make magnetic fields to play with the spin states. Our idea is to use the expertise on, on, on like mm, quantum sensors that work at room temperature and in noisy environments and actually take the technology used to control and study those sensors and apply the same apparatuses to study those, what I'm calling, living quantum sensors. Okay, The same thing that we would do to study and control the spinning diamond we can, we can do and apply the same electromagnetic pulses, read out, to read and play with those living quantum sensors. That's what we're up to uh, at in my lab now. However, this is not a talk about birds. I always start with birds, but this is not a talk about birds because there's a lot of evidence that similar spin physics might be behind many, many other physiological phenomena that go way, way beyond navigation, okay? And that's the, the cool thing. So uh, the production of reactive oxygen species, the thing that if you have too many of it is bad for yourself, uh, is also magnetic field dependent in a way that is consistent with it being regulated by spin physics. Um, Stem cell growth in uh, flatworms is also magnetic field dependent. Uh, DNA repair uh, is also uh, uh, magnetic field dependent in a way that it, it, using a not protein, it's, which is not cryptochrome, but is also uh, magnetic field respo uh, responsive. Right, right now, uh, some people in Japan have just published the fact that uh, cellular autofluorescence, possibly coming from mitochondrial uh, flavoproteins. And, and again, I didn't mention this. If flavoproteins are proteins that have a flavin, the flavin is the, the stuff that makes it fluorescent. And that's the stuff that makes cryptochrome fluorescence too. So cellular autofluorescence from mitochondrial, mitochondrial uh, flavoproteins is also magnetic field sensitive in a way that is consistent with spin physics. And this last um, picture is there because I have to tell a story. So I have a, a friend uh, from Munich, uh, Professor Peter Fierlinger, who is a hardcore precision measurement physicist. So what he does for a living is build hypomagnetic chambers. And those hypomagnetic chambers, they serve to put like ultra cold experiments inside so that you can do precision measurements without being disturbed by external magnetic fields. Those hypomagnetic chambers uh, can have noise uh, fields of nanotesla, again, magnetic field of the Earth, 50 microtesla. What Peter uh, did, and also some colleagues in Mainz did, so two groups did the same experiment. In each experiment, they grew for two days tadpoles, uh, either with the nanotesla base field of this, these chambers, 
or with a field inside mimicking the magnetic field of the Earth, about 50 microtesla. In the uh, mimicked magnetic field uh, of the Earth, macroscopically, the tadpoles developed well. However, in the absence of the magnetic field of the Earth at the nanotesla level, 30% of the embryos macroscopically were sort of deformed, as you can see in this picture. Now, it does not prove there's anything spin-related, but given the magnitude of the fields and, and, and the absence, the magnitude of the absence of the fields that are, are, are doing something crazy to, to the organism, uh, my best educated guess is that it is spin-dependent. Okay. Also, there are some papers saying that the absence of the magnetic field, other papers saying that if you grow a cell or whatever, if you do experiments uh, in the absence of a magnetic field, the people see epigenetic changes, uh, you know, genetic changes. It's sort of crazy. Again, no direct link yet to spins, but if there were like magnetic crystals that would respond to such tiny fields, they would have to be huge. And, and people have not found those huge crystals by now, except in some kind of, of magnetic bacteria. But in, in normal cells, right now, people don't think it's likely. Okay, so I think this could be a spin stuff. So this brings other questions like, well, what's the magnetic field in Mars, right, for space exploration? Can we grow lettuce in Mars? Can we reproduce in Mars? What's the magnetic field that astronauts see when they, when they do multi-generational space travel, right? Can we, can we survive multi-generational space travel? I think there's all sorts of, of super cool questions that we could start thinking about. And uh, this work is inserted in a field that is called uh, quantum biology, whose bottleneck, I think, at this point, is high-tech quantum-inspired instrumentation, right? When I build that, uh, when I say that I'm going to build a microscope, the microscope is not going to look like the stuff to your left. It's going to look like an atomic physics experiment. It's going to look like what you would see if you entered a quantum sensing atomic physics experiment, except that our sample is not a diamond, is a cell. Okay. And I'm going to make the heresy to, to say that I think quantum biology may be now where quantum computing was 30 years ago, right? There was a lot of theory, not a lot of experiments, then some crazy groups started to try to do gates between quantum objects when those gates were uh, realized, there was a boom. Many other people started uh, looking at those things, and now there's like a healthy quantum industry. I think that maybe we are at that edge with quantum biology once we have high-tech instrumentation. Okay. Uh, I want to mention that um, our experimental approach differently from, uh, from what is usually done in biology. And that's just different. It's not better or worse. But our experimental approach is, is actually driven by mathematical methods. We start with the hypothesis and we end with something that we want to either refute or, uh, or, uh, uh, or prove, right? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the photophysics of cryptochrome uh, is given by the flavin, that is, that is the stuff that makes it it, um, it fluorescent. And what we do is we use the photophysics parameters of the Slavin that are published. Uh, we use uh, a spin model that consists, again, of two, two electron spins and one nuclear spin. And we can make uh, 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 open quantum system simulations on how those two spins evolve in the presence of different external magnetic fields, be them at different directions, frequencies, uh, and magnitudes. Okay, and we can start making predictions. And um, I'm going to describe just one prediction that I find very cool. I won't explain it all, but this is the type of curve that we 
predict. And those are the type of, of curves that I would love to have in the lab. I'm dying to take this curve to see if our prediction holds or not, or if we have to refine our model or not. So please look at the top right uh, uh, the, the graph there, okay? Just the top right. What I plot there is the predicted magnetosensitivity of cryptochrome as a function of uh, an external magnetic field strength. So the magnetosensitivity is how much a changing magnetic field can alter the, the, the proportion of, of chemical reaction going in the two different branches. Okay? What, what we find in theory is that the magnetosensitivity as a function of the field strength that it sees is not monotonic. It goes up and down. At about 10 times the magnetic field of the Earth, the, the, the magnetosensitivity has gone down by a lot. Okay? This means that this phenomena Phenomena, phenomenon that I've been describing happens at low fields, okay? If you put those things in a, in a magnetic resonance machine, it will not work. If you increase the strength of the, the field, it does not help, okay? So what's also important is that things that, that we, we hold in our hands, you know, like your refrigerator, your microwave, your, your cell phone, those are all producing relatively tiny field. Fields, okay. So I, I I do ask the question. I'm not saying don't use your phone, but but I think people need to study, like really what the effect of those things are, because there are important chemical reaction reactions that are sensitive to such tiny fields. Okay, it's not the strength of the field; it's the fact that they're they're tiny. Another important thing that you see in this curve is that it sort of peaks the the rel the the Exact peak depends on simulation parameters, but it sort of peaks very close to the magnetic field of the Earth, which might be a coincidence, or it might be that there might have been some evolutionary pressure for it to evolve better in the environment where it evolved. We cannot resolve this, but we think that people who do uh, uh, directed evolution of proteins in the lab can help us check if this is a coincidence or not. So uh, the, 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 to sum up, what we want to do in our, in our lab is to either establish or refute or give a, a narrow bound, right, to check whether quantum physics has to do with macroscopic, physiologically relevant phenomena sensed by those biological spins. And importantly, can we tune those endogenous quantum mechanical knobs to technological and therapeutic advantage? For example, right, if nature is truly using quantum mechanical degrees of freedom to work, it definitely knows how to deal with noise. Right? So I'm not saying, well, let's replace Google's wonderful quantum computer uh, with a molecule. But rather, is there something that molecules do that we can implement, like a technique or something, a way of dealing with noise that we can actually implement onto existing technological platforms to make them more resilient to noise? The second thing that we want to do is, can we build a systematic map on how we can tune, how we can manipulate those spins in order to drive physiology, right? You can think about... Uh, you can think about that for either diagnostics or even trying to correct disease pathways. Okay, and I think there's a lot of room for us to do this in the long, long. Term. This is not going to happen in five years, ten years. This is a long-term journey. And again, we're not the first ones to be doing quantum-enhanced experiments in biology. There are very recent papers. You see, like seventeen, seventeen, nineteen, and those people are starting to apply quantum techniques to look at biology. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and like, I really think that quantum biology and interdisciplinary in general is what's going to help us solve cool things in the near future, right? I'm not endorsing nature, but I'm really endorsing this cover of nature. I think it's very cool. And there's Doc Quantum there to the left. Next time we play, I want to be 
Doc Quantum. And I hope I have convinced you that we made the, the turn between quantum mechanics and biology and quantum mechanics and technologies again. And finally, I would like to, to thank my group members uh, who agreed to join a starting group in the middle of a pandemic in a topic that sometimes is not well accepted by the community. Uh, but this is what I wanted to talk to you today. So may the quantum be with you. What are your questions? Thank you, Clarice, for this really wonderful uh, talk. Uh, we got to learn a lot. And, and I mean, I did not, um, well, I, 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 I did not know, you know, a lot of this big picture behind uh, spin fix, which is very, 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 very exciting, you know, and I, I got to learn that now. And, and I'm sure all of us here, I agree. I want to give you sort of virtual I mean, sound is not virtual, but you know, just uh, <laughs> thank you. yeah, ap applause. Uh, thank you very much again. Um, what are your questions? Yes. Yes. So now it's open for questions, guys. Uh, you can ask question about uh, what you think about Alice's talk, what what you learned, if there are curiosity, more curiosity, right? I have like one or two I want to also ask yes. Clarice. <laughs> Maybe first I'll give opportunity to our young audience here. You, you should have yes. been you should have been super confused at many points of this talk. <laughs> it's it, you should be have been astonished. So I, I hope you have been astonished by some of the mm -hmm. things that you heard. Um Maybe one thing that I uh, I have been curious about, I mean, like migratory birds and navigation, this is something very, very exciting, right? And for example, uh, echolocation in, in uh, bats, right? that is another very exciting thing for me. Yeah. And what I wonder is, you know, when it comes to like simulations of or, or demonstration, right, of, of, uh, of uh, spins interacting this many body systems and sort of the exponential scale, scaling of, of, you know, quantum mechanics. It's a huge system, first of all, when we're talking about, for example, you know, bird, right? Yeah. Um, I, I wonder, you know, like how people go about, you know, that, right, first of all dealing with many body system. Uh, maybe one thing is just build the setup on the lab and, and see the evolution of quantum system. But simulations wise, uh, can you like, you know, reduce the system, like or have an approximate model, you know, for the it's whole like a, bird navigation. So, so th this is why I think we have to start small, right? We have to make smaller steps from the chemical level. So, uh, there's really a big disconnect. We can, uh, I don't think in the near future or even in the near, t in the medium future, I don't think we're going to be able to, to model a bird, right? So is there something that we can do towards that? Can we start small, start with a cell, then grow to like a cup of cells, then grow to a tissue, then grow to an embryo? I think there has to be some systematization there. Uh, because I, I think that there's no way we're going to, in a live organism, like in a live macroscopic organism, uh, uh, see anything that is quantitative and irrefutable in terms of the spin physics. There are consistent observations, but I think we need to go beyond that. Right? We need to do, if if you will, we need to start doing coherent measurements onto biological systems. We, we need to do this because there is no way around this. And this is not going to happen in a bird, right? It needs to be grown from the ground up. It's not going to happen in my lifetime, like like going to get into the bird. But I think it's, it's, it's something that needs to get done. I, I don't think that just taking the bird as a big many body system is going to help us at this stage, given our technology or, or capabilities now at all. At all. Okay, thank you. 
Um, and, and there, there are some questions. Oh, you want to? Uh, yes, there is. There is a question from Nitesh, and he asks, "Are there some applications in the medical field already related to this phenomenon? And like we have MRI for large magnetic field, can we expect something like that for small magnetic field?" So uh, the, the, the quick answer is no. There are no medical applications because biology people don't know about that. So a p part of, of my job is like educate both physicists and, and biologists and chemists of, of what I mean by, by this and what can be done, right? It, it's, it's really like a nowhere man's, no man's land because quantum physicists, the first thing that they say, sometimes they don't even engage. They say, oh, room temperature quantum phenomena does not, do, do not exist. And that's why I, I put the, the diamond example, right? Well, they do exist, right? Your diamond at three gigahertz is immersed in a, in a 6,000 gigahertz and it works for a short time. So it's the same with nature, but physicists, sometimes they won't engage. Uh, bio people, historically, they have done control of things chemically. And what we're proposing here is electromagnetic control, like electromagnetic interaction with biological things, which is a little bit different from, from what they're used to, right? So, so they don't, they don't, they need to be convinced that this has an application. And to, to make things even crazier, right? If I Google quantum biology in my, in, 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 in my in my computer, hit number 13 is about quantum healing, right? People who say it, well, you wear the magnet and you, so there, there's a lot of misconception there it, it, that the people don't want to talk about it because, because there's like charlatans, physicists say never going to happen. Biologists say, why do we need this? So it's, it, it, it's hard. I think there's a lot of potential, but we do need to bring people to the table. In the same way that you guys are bringing all sorts of people to talk about quantum, I think it's time for us to do the same for quantum biology, right? To explain to everyone and to explain what the potentiality for medicine, for technology could be. It's not going to happen tomorrow, right? It's just a long-term vision, but, but someone has to start dialogue. Yes, I, I completely agree. I mean, one of uh, one of the problems, you know, we were like, um, I was, uh, for example, well, I, I was listening to different talks back in my university when I was doing PhD, and there was a question, you know, uh, is room, is water, liquid water, quantum mechanical at room temperature, you know, for example, right? Are there like, are there quantum effects um, in, in, for example, uh, you know, protein formation or DNA replication, right? I mean, these are very, very relevant question. You know, yeah. do they enhance? It, yeah. It, it, and also, I think it's important noise driven processes. Okay. So, um, uh, 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 there is an experiment uh, from the ion trapping group in Berkeley. Okay. Where they sort of implemented a, a, a simplified model of, of, uh, exciton transport, okay? What they had was two, uh, 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 two ions, two ion qubits, okay? One was pointing up and the other was pointing down and they wanted to transfer the information. To, to cut a long story short, they wanted to flip it, okay? And they implemented a Hamiltonian where uh, you could actually make those qubits uh, interact resonantly interact with the bath that is with with with, with like uh, with vibrations okay if those vibrations which are usually bad right it's, it's noise it's bad it's vibrations if those vibrations matched some transitions you could uh, you could uh, actually either give noise to the give energy to the environment or get energy from the environment so that actually it was easier to flip the spin. So like quantum mechanical transport has been shown with this experiment and others to, uh, to be able to be enhanced in the presence of noise. And this is something that I, I reckon happens in nature all the time. Somehow noise in some instances help things happen. Mm, I see. 
that's very interesting, like electron transfer processes, right? For example. Yeah. Maybe that's another example. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any, any more question from, from our audience here? This is a very exciting, exciting talk. I mean, uh, the, 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 the field like it, it touches, you know, like from physics. I mean, maths is always there, chemistry, biology. Yeah. It's, it's super ex exciting. Yes, um, I think we all enjoyed it very much, uh, Clarice. Uh, Thanks for really having me. To, yes, thank you again for for uh, giving the talk. Uh, and I guess now I'm in Nepal. I think people are about to sleep. You're about to go to work, I guess. <laughs> um, yes. I'm about to go home uh, from my work. Um, and we look forward to, to, you know, hear your talk. I mean, again, at, at some point. You I, know, I look uh, forward to interacting with you all. I, I really do hope one, one quantum, uh, one quantum Nepal and one quantum in general grows. I, I'm, 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 um, I, I told the same thing to, uh, what's his name? Fry. He's also okay. awesome. You're also awesome. Yes. Uh, like one quantum, I, I have no doubt is in good hands and I'm really looking forward <laughs> to interacting more with you. you. You got some, this great initiative on your hands and I'm super, super impressed. Thank you. Thank you, Clarice. Thank you very much uh, for, 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 uh, for those words. And, and we, we hope to grow, you know, like more in, in the next. Let uh, me, let me know how year. I can help. Let, let me know how I can help. All right. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Okay. Clarice and, and uh, bye bye and everybody. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Uh, nice meeting you uh, all. Take bye -bye. care. Bye-bye. <clears throat>